Hello and welcome to episode 6 of the Verbal to Visual podcast. I am your host Doug Neal and today I'm sharing a conversation with Chris Payne in which we talk about how to use your sketchnoting skills to inspire action and help the folks you work with move down the right path. And as much as I enjoy experiential learning and encouraging folks to take risks and learn from their mistakes, there is something to be said for listening to the advice from someone who's already been down the roads that you're looking to travel. So in this conversation, you'll get to hear us chat about the role that sketchnoting might play in that situation. You can find the show notes for today's episode at verbaltovisual.com slash six. Let's get into it. All right. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for chatting today. Uh, To get things started, why don't you introduce yourself, let folks know uh, who you are, where you're coming from, and uh, a little bit about the the work that you do and where sketchnoting fits in. And then from there, we can jump into uh, a question or two to explore. Okay, so my name is uh, Christopher John Payne. I live in England. I live just outside London. I'm 59 years old, two sons, and my focus is at the moment I have written 22 books um, and some of them include sketches, a series of sketches, and I also teach people how to create books of around about 100 pages to publish on Amazon. Hmm. So rather than having a book that's 250 pages, 300 pages, how do we create a book that's going to take about an hour to read and teaches one narrow topic and one way to make the book interesting to look at is to lay it out nicely inside and include a series of images, the kind that you, Doug, would put on mm-hmm. slides so that when people flick through the book, they say, this book looks interesting. I've just bought three books on relationships, how to repair arguments and relationship. I bought three off Amazon. I'm going to read this one first because it looks so inviting. Hmm. So I teach that process. I have hundreds of people in my program, which where I deliver webinars. I do one-on-one coaching. I even have a workshop that people can come to in my home. So that gives you a framework of what I do at the moment. Yeah, I mean, that. I think that's very, very interesting and uh, appealing to me, not surprisingly, you know, someone who's very much into sketchnoting, but uh, I'm also like really interested in that overlap of um, sketchnoting and, and writing. Uh, and I like the kind of um, constraint that you put on the uh you know, authorship process, the writing process of, yeah, don't worry about making a 200 or 300 page book, just make it a hundred pages, focus on like one specific topic and uh, weave in these sketched elements to, to help readers along that journey. Um, this, this sounds very cool and the type of thing that I, I want to make now too. Maybe I'll have to uh, sign up for uh, a webinar and some of the the things that you're making. Sure. Um, and I so, want to jump in there, Doug, if I may, yeah, and, um, and make a, a point which trying to riff off what you've said, which is this idea of constraint. And mm-hmm. it makes me think of what creates art and beauty. And my experience through working with illustrators and designers, because I, over the years, have had a number of businesses and I adore briefing designers in some way and your key people and what i notice is this the tighter the constraints that i deliver to somebody like yourself if i was asking you to do something the narrower the constraints the more beautiful i get the more elegant Mm. it is and it reminds me of things like um uh, poetry that's been created on Twitter, so it has to be done in X number of characters. Or we mm. say the whole book has to be done as a handwritten sketch note thing. Yeah. So within all, you can only use 10 hundred words in a book if you know the book Thing Explainer. Do you know Thing Explainer? I don't. No. Oh, let me explain. Maybe it's worth it saying. So this <laughs> is it's a book called Thing Explainer. It's a, a cartoonist, Monroe something. Monroe, 
who did the book, who did the cartoon X C O M D or something. And the yeah. book it shows, explains how a microwave works, but only using a thousand words. Or rather, because a thousand is not a, a popular word, it uses 10 hundred words. So rather than it being a microwave, it shows a, a, a sketch of a microwave and it says food warmer upper and then uses <laughs> the list of a thousand words, only a thousand words to explain how it works. And a lunar landing vehicle is something else. Um, that uses very simple language to explain how it works. And within the constraints of 10 hundred words, this book explains modern scientific equipment in such a simple, elegant way that the book became a massive bestseller. Hmm. That sounds really cool. I just pulled it up and uh, I think I might have to add that to my, uh, my cart. Fantastic. Um, Cool. Well, that's some uh, interesting work that you're up to. Is there a particular uh, subject area that you tend to focus on with the the books that you write? Um, a lot. Of, some of my books are how to create books and how to use <laughs> templates mm -hmm. to come up with titles and subtitles, which is important. Um, but w often what I'm teaching is core universal principles for success. So I have a, a book that I privately publish and only give to my members called The Five Frogs Principle, which is, I think it's 38 principles for success. And I use a little story uh, about the Five Frogs Principle. So uh, to give you an example, uh, there's a joke which you may have come across, which is five frogs on a lily pad and three of them decide to jump off the lily pad into the water. How many frogs are there on the lily pads? Two. Exactly. Like that's going to be. Oh no, that's right. Okay. But it and it's not correct because it's actually five because the five frogs decided to three frogs decided to jump in, but they didn't actually jump, so they're still mm. there. So it, we can decide <laughs> that we're going to commit to drawing one image a day in sketch noting. We can decide we're going to use sketch noting. But that's not the same as actually doing it. And right. the moment we understand that there's a difference between decision and action, and, of course, this idea of the fable uh, is, oh, this, this joke is fabulous. So, of course, I then get that illustrated. So I use a professional illustrator to do that as a line art. So, you know, there's no shading to illustrate the point, you see. So I use fables and jokes and photographs to actually teach core underlying lessons to how to succeed in life and create nice. a business. Great. Well, um, that sounds like interesting work. Uh, what, what question would you like to explore today? Right. So one of the things, so I have a, just think about it this way. I am fascinated by things like, and I don't think it's been explored very much, this idea of memory. We say we're going to do X. So I will say I'm going to do X later today. And then, of course, we don't do it. So when I'm working with clients, they get all excited and they say, I've got an idea for a book. And then the next morning, they've forgotten that they've actually had that idea. So my hmm. question for you is, what are the kind of ways that I can use sketch noting to begin to teach people how much we forget and even though we think we remember stuff, like I'm going to stand up now and go into the bathroom to get such and such from the shelf. <laughs> but when I go in there, I forget. Now, it's all very well. People go, oh, yeah, I've done that. But how can I use sketch noting for people to really go, oh, my gosh, I really do need to write things down and find ways to look at those on a regular basis because what I think with certainty I remember in half an hour's time, actually I won't. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a great topic to explore and um in in kind of an interesting way, like aligns with why I first got interested in sketchnoting in the first place, uh, which for me came from this uh experience of, you know, reading books or listening to podcasts and really enjoying the, the information that came across there and getting excited about those ideas and, 
you know, maybe for a day or two or a week or two after taking in that information, being able to like chat about those ideas with, a, with other people and feel pretty good about my understanding of the ideas. It was a real quick drop off in terms of what I was able to remember, what I was able to like talk about and summarize of the, the book that I had read. Um, so that's why I started sketching out ideas and uh, leaned in so hard into sketch noting because I wanted to, you know, remember and apply the ideas that I was learning. Um, but the way that you just described it, it's almost like th the same type of thing happens, but often on a much smaller time scale, like something that you, you know, decide to do today, like you mentioned, but then tomorrow forget that you made that decision. And then that kind of just floats away into the ether. Um, so I appreciate the role that I think uh, visuals and any like, uh, often I think of sketchnoting as kind of a externalization of your brain. You're kind of like taking some of the, the processing power or the, um, the recall that uh, your brain has a limited capacity for and creating this like physical sketched artifact that your brain can reference, it can look at and see that thing, but it doesn't have to, to store all of that information itself. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the first place my brain goes when thinking about that question of um, showing people how much they have the potential to forget things and helping them to remember them. Uh, the simple, maybe too simple, two-step process uh, would be to first sketch out that thing that you want to remember and then post it somewhere that you'll see it uh, at various times in my uh, career. And depending on what projects I'm working on, I'll often have uh, a dedicated portion of my wall for different projects. Uh, like often I'll use my office door as a place to put, you know, sticky notes for the, the tasks that I'm working on or want to work on so that, you know, I see those anytime I leave the office and come back. Uh, but then for kind of bigger projects, I like having a, a bigger chunk of a wall to capture ideas kind of as they come, uh, almost as like a large area for, for brainstorming so that when those ideas come, I can jot them down or sketch them out, put them on the wall. And then that's like, uh, that's a consistent storage place for things that I, I want to remember. Uh, so I feel like that's one, you know, specific strategy that, that folks might use to remind themselves of the previous decisions that they made. Um, literally just having like a, a dedicated space on a wall, in a notebook, someplace that they see regularly uh, to not forget those things. Um, how does how does that hit you yeah. and your experience with, with working with folks around this as a, a general approach? So for me, as something that I can do, there's no doubt that, because I'm trying to create a big aha for people about this because I think it is hard for people because what I'm trying to get across is, is what I'm really trying to do is create an action because it's all very well for people to understand that they forget stuff as they walk outside the room, that they, they walk out the door without the keys. It's another thing to realise that they're doing that with everything else. So what people, my members say is, you know, I say, well, tell me something that's happened in your life that's interesting. And it's like, well, nothing's ever happened in my life. Well, you know, have you ever had any problems? You're like, right now, do you have, a, you know, how many problems have you got? And they say, well, I, I just literally, honestly, Chris, I don't have a single problem. And so people struggle in the moment to think. And we want to normalize that process. So I'm trying to think in a playful way how to use imagery where I can show them a series of images where they go, 
I see now and normalizes their behavior and gets them to see using a series of images how they can actually see the importance of actually using paper in any form, whether it's words or images, and actually do something different. Because the challenge with any webinar is people can email us afterwards say that is the most amazing webinar it was so beautifully explained which of course is no meaning to me all that I care about is the person who says and this is what I have done and I think that is quite a hard thing to get people to do is to get people to shift their action so I'm always fascinated by anything like a visual or or an image that actually makes people go I'm in now so I think I've covered Mm. a number of areas there yeah yeah no i like that you uh pointed out this uh gap and i guess this is kind of what we've been talking about the whole time here the gap between like idea and action Mm -hmm. um whether it's an idea that uh you know comes up to you in like a moment of inspiration and you're like oh yeah that's a that's a good idea that i want to act on um maybe you know they decide to do something um or it's you know something they come across in like a book that they're reading or a podcast that they're listening to uh maybe like a principle for example that you might share in one of your books and they're like yes that's that's a great idea um but there's this uh gap that often exists between first coming across that idea, whether it's self-generated or comes from some some other source, and then actually acting on it. Um, and I think there's kind of two, two ways to come at like how to bridge that gap. Uh, one is to um, provide some sort of tool or reference um, as the the author, uh, as the person sharing the idea, like what can you provide to help this person who is digging into your material actually take action on it? Um, and then the other approach, which is kind of more uh, within the realm of like uh, teaching folks to to sketch note, I guess. And in my case, like how can you equip folks generally with tools to make that uh, leap themselves. Um, but I think where, where you're at and what you're describing is that, that first, from that first perspective of being someone who's, uh, exploring these topics on, you know, how to, uh, be, be successful and, um, uh, establishing these principles for success. What one of and using visuals, visual tools to help people actually take action. One of the things that I've found to be helpful and um, that uh, I've gotten good feedback on uh, within the the courses that I share is um, in addition to, you know, using sketched slides maybe, or, you know, illustrations within your book to help communicate an idea. Uh, that's a great way to like, you know, uh, summarize information and communicate well the the ideas that you're exploring. Um, I think a great addition to that is uh, often maybe using the same uh, visuals that you've established and creating some sort of a, a template or a checklist something that becomes this reference point for the reader that um, has a, a strong visual connection to the the material that they just read about, but yeah. that is structured in a way that they have to then go in and uh, fill in the, the empty spaces or where there's a prompt or these checklists that they have to, to fill out. So, it's it's a piece that has this sketched um, n- nature to it uh, that those those sketches connect to the ideas that they just learned, but it's also participatory in that the the person who just printed out that template, for example, like they have to be the ones to go in and respond to the prompt or uh, you know uh, complete this this checklist. Um, so I I feel like that 
does enough for the reader or the person taking your course. It's enough. It gets them over enough of a barrier to actually take action as opposed to not doing anything with those ideas. I'm curious if you've done, if within the, the books or any of the things that you've created, if anything has kind of fit within that realm of a, uh, a visual template or even just like visual checklist, things like that as a resource to help bridge the gap for your readers between idea and action. What I notice is, um, and it is a fascinating one, is if I do provide a template, it's amazing how people look through the template and then go, oh yeah, get it now. And then they do it free form. So it's, it's hard for people sometimes to even work within a template. And part of it, I think, is because a lot of my audience is, you know, 40 and 50 and over. Mm. There's, there's, it's hard to follow rule, you know, follow <laughs> guidelines. So, yeah. and what they do is if I say, look, there's a three-step process here. It's amazing how people read that and then they actually do it differently. So, I mean, the, <laughs> you know, the old joke of here's a three, a five-point checklist. You know, the first item is, read these instructions, but do not ask, act on any of them until you've read every single one. Step two, draw a square, you know. And of course, the bottom step is uh, make sure you use a red pen. And of course, mm. what happens is people get to step two and they draw the square with, the, with whatever pen is right in front of them. Because even though instruction one is, you know, read all, these, all the steps, that's hard for people to do. Because what they want to do is take the next step, which is step two, rather than read to the end of the seven steps or whatever it is. And then the seventh step actually gives the important information that frames the rest. Now, of course, you know, mm. that's just a metaphor um, for it. Yeah. But I, it, I think for me, it's, work under, it's trying to work with the most difficult and challenged individual mm. to, for them to have that breakthrough where they wouldn't, they find it a real challenge to follow checklists. You know, mm. you almost have got to go to another level, which is how you're know, getting them back into childlike wonder mode where they're even willing to follow a checklist, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my first thought about that type of, uh, I mean, the, the specific example that you just gave there is, uh, um, I guess I, I get that it's a way to test whether or not people follow directions, <laughs> but it's also a very, you know, poorly designed uh, checklist for someone whose intention is to actually like uh, exactly. complete the task. So um, yeah, from a instructor who, you know, wants to help, someone through this like particular challenge i don't think that uh someone creating that type of checklist obviously you're that's an example of like an instructor just setting their students up to fail of um, course but, so, even, but on the positive side it shows them how hard it shows them how hard it is for people because really what matters is how many people fail in the nicest possible way and of course, if it's for half, that's really good. And it teaches them one thing, which is this shows the importance of really simplifying instructions. But equally, yeah. it teaches us that that it's hard to follow instructions in a systematic way, you know, and that we don't read, we don't follow the instruction, which is read all seven instructions before you even start. So right. you can look at it both ways. And I'm saying, yes, there's two ways of looking at it. And it's how best to teach and how best to encourage people to follow a systematic process which is hard to do yeah yeah and i'm i'm starting to think that there's kind of like a um potentially helpful like middle ground to mm -hmm. to shoot for in terms of um how uh how systematic how strict the process is that you're encouraging folks to follow. Um, so it's kind of like very strict process on one end, a very loose process on the other. 
Um, and to me, what seems to be the, the most important thing is that uh, people that are, you know, reading this book, that they actually take action. So yeah. like one, just taking any action is good because, you know, it's so easy not to take action. Uh, and then the second question is, okay, what's the, you know, best sequence of actions from your perspective that your students can take? Um, and I very much get the the piece of, you know, and I, I think I fall into this category too of uh, depending on the nature of the instructions and the steps that I'm given, I might have the thought of like, oh, I'm going to, I don't need to follow it in exactly that way. Yeah. I, I would rather do it in this way. And like after doing that, it's probably, I don't know what the, the ratio is, but at least 50-50 of like, oh, like I should not have done that my own way. I should have just followed the steps. But even in not following the steps, in like seeing where I maybe have a hang up or whatever, uh, I feel like learning occurs there in a, a deeper sort of learning that I wouldn't have gotten to if I had followed the, the checklist, you know? So it's like uh, by not following it, running into some issue and then realizing, oh, that that first step that I ignored or that second or third step that I ignored, that actually is important. So I've like had this experience. Let me go back and like follow these steps in, in order. And even though that's less efficient for me as a learner uh, or as a, as a producer of whatever it is that I'm working on, I feel like there is deep learning there. So I guess I bring that up just to be like, how can you, um, uh, kind of account for that type of experience where, you know, there's enough of a, a framework to the uh, the creation process that you're taking folks through to provide that kind of uh, through line or, or motivation or to, to get people to actually take action. Um, uh, accounting for uh, those times when, when people choose to go off on their own and not follow directions. Um, but like, yeah, just to still be able to, to bring them back to the, uh, a potentially stricter checklist or sequence of actions once they realize, oh, like doing, doing it my own way didn't really work. Um, I mean, what yeah, comes I up think me? about that, that spectrum of loose versus strict. I feel like there's, that's an interesting place to like play around with. I agree. But what comes up for me when we when I hear you, it's like, oh, we could have like a, re, you know, here's some, here's a quick FAQ at the end or something, and we have, you know, using sketch notes to 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 show somebody saying, oh, you know, in a, like a particular individual, which is, oh, I know what I want to do. I'm going to do it slightly differently, and then using humor or as a simple cartoon sequence to show that doing a couple of those sequence steps out of sequence actually does cause a problem. Mm -hmm. And so using humor, and I think where I'm listening to you is the power of sketching to break through people's, oh, I'm not going to follow the instructions because mm -hmm. I just want to do it my own way. And then knowing that people can do that, have a little cartoon sequence underneath where the where somebody decides to break the rule and there's a consequence and actually, oh yes, then it makes sense to actually follow. There must be something I can do there. But I can see that done in sketches rather than words, you know. Yeah, and actually I think that's a nice um, connection to a piece, uh, uh, a word that you used earlier. I think you used the word fable in terms of like one of the uh, mm. almost instructional uh, a piece in your instructional toolkit. Uh, I think you mentioned that in connection with the, you know, general principles for success. Uh, and I feel like that's a key part of fables. It's like often it's a, a story about how not to do a thing. Uh, you know, even a person uh, going through something with the best of intentions follows this path, but then this thing happens. Um, and I do, I can kind of picture that type of, uh, story shared in a, you know, cartoon, uh, comic, like even if it's just, you know, like a three panel 
uh, beginning, middle, end story, um, using that as a format to uh, point out, you know, potential pitfalls or yeah. uh, especially if you've identified like the specific way in which uh, people maybe ignore <laughs> directions or if they go off and do their do their own thing what the the common uh, pitfalls or specific challenges of doing it that way um, that you might be able to communicate up front to um, kind of like you said like save people the the trouble and the uh, negative consequences that might come from from going down that path and uh even like I'm thinking about what the the uh, visual structure of that looks like, and I'm, I'm picturing you know something like your standard uh, comic sequence of you know side by side scenes that show this this fable of what could go wrong, but then um, in the next set of slides or visuals or whatever it is, you know maybe with something like a, a flow chart like okay, this, this, let's tell the story again, but from the first scene, instead of going this way and following up with like this action that leads to the negative consequences, let's take a different path, like that the character goes on um, by following the directions that you're suggesting and what leads, uh, what results from that like alternative path. So it's kind of like choose your own adventure. Like you could go this way, but here's why I really suggest you go this way instead. Something like that sounds like. Exactly. I can just see those visuals coming together in that way. Yeah, and what jumps out for me in the words we've, you've said is because I'm listening to you and I'm sketching, I'm writing in notability on my iPad with my nice. pen. And what I'm noticing is the, the alliteration of P for path. So there's a path, but then there's also pitfalls with a P mm. where, where there's a mm-hmm. problem. And then you use the word pointing out. So we've got another P. So there's pointers to the path and to pitfalls. And then this idea of flowcharts, which I've not considered. So I'd be fascinated um, to see this. And of course, then we can mapping onto that is the hero's, so Campbell's hero's journey, where, you know, one of the challenges right from the very beginning is being stuck in the wasteland. And there's, there were given choices of paths to take I and mean, of course often you know, the biggest thing or the most fascinating step for me in the hero's journey is refusal of the call because what we're teaching often is as a as a communicator is we are offering them an invitation to go on a journey and the, the first response which is most amazing is no so and there's a series of no's so the person we're giving them advice and there's a series of, no, I'm not prepared, not ready yet. Da, 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 da. And then at some point they say yes. And what we're creating here is we're trying to facilitate in the best way to minimize the number of no's before somebody says, yes, I'm in. Yes, I commit. Yes, I'm taking action. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I'm glad you... Uh, pointed out the huh, she's pointed out again uh, the, the alliteration there uh, multiple use of kind of those those p words of path and, and pitfalls and um, I feel like for me what's what's standing out from our, our conversation so far is the uh, use of sketch noting to um, very literally show these potential paths that that folks could take. Um, and I feel that as a as a helpful kind of organizing framework for folks that are you know creating, whether it be like instructional materials or motivation materials, like identifying those paths that you see your audience members or your students or whatever it is, uh, the paths that you see them going through when they kind of. Uh, go through that on their own and how you might be able to like nudge people towards this other path um, and what that distinct path looks like. Um, Yeah. I feel like that's interesting. Has that, have you 
the, with the visuals that you've included in in your books and the the sketches that you've done, have have you ever used that type of kind of path structure before, or would that be something no, new that you might experiment with? Exactly, that's new. So what I think from talking with you, I mean, what would be absolutely amazing is you know it's almost like it's, you know to like if you know if we had more time, it's almost like all right, let's let's do a a giant sketch of what I'd love to see mm-hmm. how you're drawing and you know so I think it's almost like a google docs where right. I could see your sketching and I could sketch on the side you know and it's like um we create it's like oh I see what you're doing because what I'm fascinated by is what's in your mind now so I'd be fascinated hmm. to to know be able to read your mind and see what you're laying out but mm-hmm. I think where I am having had listening to you is I feel inspired and I think and I'm excited to move forward and think what visual elements can I bring now to now create these different contrasts and try things out and then be able to say to you, look what I have created, Doug, as a result of this mishmash of conversation where we're trying things out um, and out of that discussion create something that wasn't in existence before. Yeah, I think that's great. And to kind of circle back to the um, kind of underlying question and intention that you brought in here uh, and to throw it to to you, I hear you being excited to, to, to try out this uh, somewhat new way of, uh, you know, depicting a story and potential paths that, that folks might go down. Uh, maybe you've decided to experiment with that format. Uh, One potential way to bridge your gap between the idea and maybe like the the rough visuals that you have in your mind uh, and to actually take action on them, I feel like uh, public accountability is can be a helpful tool there too. I found that within the verbal to visuals new online learning environment that we've got set up specifically within the the community branch there uh we've started within the monthly mastermind chats that happen there we end those by saying okay what do you want to be held accountable for in one month's time um and even just like stating that out loud to a group of people is something that's going to help that memory stay there and not go away so that tomorrow or the next week you actually do take action. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I bring that up to ask you, Chris, if there's a specific um, thing that you would like to be held accountable for, knowing that a certain number of people are going to be listening to this and uh, uh, might want to follow up with you and see what you create from this conversation uh what is there something you'd like to be held accountable for based on what we chatted about and what you might do with these ideas yes so i have just begun as you're speaking now creating a sketch which actually shows a path so it shows a metaphor of a map you know so i've drawn a map with a process on it so i can show the early versions of those in the uh, area so other people can see and see how it develops. And uh, so I can just log the process of me creating the different versions from the initial very rough sketch to something that actually I can show on one of my web, my next webinar, which will be in a couple of weeks from the members of my program. That sounds great. Uh, and if you're comfortable with it too, I'd love to yeah. uh, share that sketch within the show notes of this podcast whenever this goes live so uh listeners can go go check it out um and as a part of a a wrap-up process for our conversation what do you feel like has been the uh takeaway for you from our conversation today well one of the things that's really great is the importance of stepping into the unknown so stepping into this call with you and in the interaction between us it's like uh, we're bouncing off each other and the power of a second person to listen because you are a very skilled listener you're very good at reflecting back and in the reflecting back i got greater clarity on my thinking so we've been on a journey in the last 30 minutes 
and I'm in a better place than I am now. And it's really okay to go in with confusion and uncertainty and be able to come out and say, look, I have now got a process to move forward. So this idea of um, the path, which was a simple word, which should be obvious to me, but wasn't, suddenly appears through you suggesting it. I jump on that and I now have a, a sketch that I can is the beginning of a new process for me. So I'm profoundly grateful to you. That's great. I'm I'm glad to hear that. And I love that encouragement to step into the unknown. Cause I feel like there's so many uh small ways and big ways that we can each do that on a daily basis. Um and how that unknown can be be scary, but uh good things often come out of it. Um and I think good things came out of this conversation. So I appreciate you uh, taking the time to chat today. And uh, for listeners that want to uh, follow along with what you're up to, what's a, a good way for folks to do that? Well, um, one thing they can do is they can contact me personally at hellochrispayne, P-A-Y-N-E at gmail.com, which is very welcome to do. I have a website at christopherjohnpayne.com. And uh, if they're interested in seeing some of my sketches or something like that, we could even create a page where they can contact me at Chris Payne, ChristopherJohnPayne.com slash sketches. How about that? And um, I will actually show some of my sketches and they can see images from uh, a couple of my books that include sketches. And I'll just send them out to people, anybody who drops me a line at that page. Sounds great. Uh, I will include uh, links to those within the show notes and encourage folks to go uh, check out Chris uh, Chris's work, both uh, past, present, and future. Um, good things going on. And thank you, because I, you know, Doug, I what's so fabulous about you is I just stumble across you on YouTube. I listen to you. I get this no like. I get to know you. Get to like you. Get to trust you. Now I'm in the program. That journey, that path that I followed, that worked for me to sign up. And so I want to thank you for your incredible videos and very inspiring videos. And I look at those and I think, ooh, look at Doug's journey. I wonder where I will be with <laughs> the way that I'm doing my things and that my level of sketch noting is at X. And through your support and going through the course that I've signed up for, I know it'll be further along. So I'm very grateful for your generosity and uh, spirit. Ah, oh, well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that so much. And um, what's fun about sketchnoting in general, and what what I've found is that, like, I get a lot of energy from the combination of, you know, following my own path and like pursuing the things that I'm interested in and weaving sketch noting in, but then just as much to like hearing about what folks like you and other sketch noters, what they're up to as well. And uh, energy comes from seeing folks go down their own individual paths too. Uh, so that's a fun, fun combo to, to play with. And I feel like you're doing that as well with the the books that you're writing and the ways in which you're interacting with other folks around uh, these these common interest points. So that's another, um, I just feel like that's a fun thing that sketchnoting in particular allows for and helps to facilitate. So um, I agree. yeah, I appreciate those, those kind words. And uh, thanks for chatting and looking forward so much to seeing uh, what comes from our, our conversation and the, the work you continue to do. So thanks, Chris. Thanks, Doc. Really appreciate it. I hope that you enjoyed that conversation between Chris and I. I will ask you a similar question that I asked Chris. Where will your path take you after listening to this conversation? Try to think of one small way that you can follow up on what you heard. If you had some of your own ideas pop up while listening, capture them right now, maybe tape them to a door or a wall before you forget them because you never know what that seed might grow into if you first just plant it.
And to continue along with that particular metaphor, if you'd like to put some energy into watering and tending that seed so that it grows into a plant that blossoms and all of these unexpected ways, consider joining us within one of Verbal to Visual sketchnoting courses, or maybe the Verbal to Visual community. Those are great places to continue building your sketchnoting skills and sharing the things that you're working on. And keep in mind that with the purchase of any of those resources, you get access to these coaching calls for free. You can find links to those resources at verbaltovisual.com and just add a slash six to get to the show notes for this particular episode. Thank you so much for listening. Good luck taking the next steps down whatever path you are following. And I look forward to chatting with you again next time. Until then.